don't buy things you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't like. I don't think we should try to get on the consumer hamster wheel of constantly wanting the next coolest thing because it's not healthy. You're never going to be happy. A resurgence of cryptocurrency. If any dollar that you put into crypto, you should be ready to lose. You know, there are so many people who are like, I love this. Yeah, I love Apple. I love it. Yeah, like it's like, oh, yeah, like cool, you have an iPhone. Doesn't necessarily mean you should be investing in the company. If you are in a workplace where you are not being treated with respect, you are not given the opportunities you deserve, given how hard you work and how well you're doing, it's time to go. Whereas when you have a diversified portfolio, you are able to better weather you know, upticks and downturns. I think you should be really honest about your financial situation because um, sex and money are the top two reasons why couples fight. I would just say, I think everybody should be getting a prenuptial agreement, get a prenup and discuss what it's going to look like if things don't work out. The same way that people buy car insurance or health insurance. It is far easier to run a company. It is significantly easier to run a company than raise a child. We're not all given a fair shake. And life, frankly, is very hard for many, many people. And we need to give them grace. And we should give ourselves grace when things don't work out the way we want them to. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. From your perspective, from you know, you create a lot of content as well. So, what are your general thoughts on AI and the general uh, landscape of how people should be feeling? the the uh, the the average American. I'm I'm going to uh, the average American. Listen, I think I have a very middle of the fairway view when it comes to AI. I think in some regards, it can be incredibly helpful. It's going to help me basically chop down on menial tasks, like taking my own notes during a meeting. Great. Like I don't have to do that anymore. Or if I need to summarize something, I can use AI to just kind of quickly scan. But ultimately I think there's a level of human creativity or human touch that needs to kind of give the final check. I certainly don't use AI to create my content because mm -hmm. it would literally come out sounding like a robot. Yeah. I promise you, at the end of the day, when AI continues to grow, I think it's a tool that you can use wisely. I don't think it's going to take over humans the way that people are, you know, spreading rumors. I do think that there are certain jobs that are, you know, the type of jobs that are very repetitive or similar motion or similar process or similar tasks that likely can be replaced with AI. But I do think that'll actually open up and free up different types of jobs for people who used to do those jobs to do in the future, because ultimately there needs to be a human check on AI to make sure that it still makes sense. You know, we used to hire a lot of uh, you know, copywriters and editors and teachers across the board to create content. And we don't use AI to create content, but these tools, what they allow us to do, it increases employee productivity by about 300%. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of scary when you, when you use that number and you just multiply it across all the companies. So, so my, I, I, I don't think people should be scared, but I think people should be willing to adapt and always learn, always be eager to learn. That's my, my opinion. People, people should use it to increase their, eff uh, to their effectiveness at job. And this will allow them to go ahead and ask for the race. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, yeah, that too. Now, Vivian, I do want to ask you, uh, what's one piece of financial advice you wish you'd received earlier in your life? Ooh. I love, I love this one because I made a lot of this mistake in my early 20s. Um, don't buy things you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't like. Mm. Um, you know, I think, especially as a woman, like you certainly get caught up with the cool girl. Um, you know, you, you see some people with this new designer bag or the right shoes or the right outfit and you want to buy those things too. And suddenly you're like, I have a closet full of junk and it was all very expensive junk and nothing really to show for it emotionally. You get that little high when you buy it, you know, when you swipe your credit card, but it doesn't build long lasting happiness. Um, my mentor, when I first met her, I wanted to be like her so badly for very shallow reasons. She would walk into work with her Gucci stiletto shoes, click clacking mm -hmm. on the floors and a brand new designer bag every single day. And I was like, wow, this person is so rich. I want to be just like her. Ultimately, I realized that the richness wasn't in those things, but the fact that she was able to take her mom on an all expenses paid vacation or be able to take her family out to dinner when they came to visit her when she went home and being able to gift experiences or provide a better life or even just buy back some of her own time. Um, that is richness, that optionality, mm. that freedom, that freedom of choice, the ability to make decisions that don't necessarily take money as a factor, that is richness. That's being truly free. And I don't think we should try to get on the consumer hamster wheel of constantly wanting the next coolest thing because it's not healthy. You're never yeah. going to be happy. Oh, a thousand percent. Let's speak about uh, newbies in investment, especially we saw a lot of newbies came during the pandemic <laughs> with all these new platforms came in and everybody started to trade and became financial experts, right? Gurus. Right, uh, gurus. Oh my gosh, yeah. kill me. So what advice do you give to such people, to someone who just starting to explore investing? Is it just simply putting money to index fund and dollar cost averaging or there's more? Into yeah, it? I would say. Um, I think that's, you know, very prudent advice, just dollar cost averaging into index funds. But if the phrase dollar cost averaging into index funds makes your head spin, one of the easiest things to do is just utilize a robo advisor. Um, essentially, you take a quick quiz about your money goals, how much you make, how much you have, when you're trying to retire, what your lifestyle looks like, and they'll pick a diversified portfolio of investments for you. The issue that a lot of uh, the issue that a lot of newbie investors run into is that they are not fully diversifying their portfolio. So what they tend to do is they're like, okay, I love this stock. I'm going to buy a bunch of this stock. Okay. What happens if that stock or that company comes under, you know, a PR nightmare, or they find out that one of the products doesn't work or their drug didn't pass phase three trials or something happens and that company tanks. So does your entire investment portfolio. Whereas when you have a diversified portfolio, you are able to better weather, you know, upticks and downturns. Um, why I like a robo advisor is sometimes that even with index funds, you can be overexposed in certain areas and underexposed in others. A robo advisor is really going to help you. Um, and it's most important to just get started as soon as possible. And a robo advisor can get you invested in 45 minutes. Um, and you don't even have to learn how to do it yourself. Uh, this is a great way to start investing right now today. And then as you have your money in the robo advisor, start learning a little bit more about investing on your own and how that makes you feel. And if you're you know, willing to dedicate the time and effort that it's going to take for you to do that. I like how, how you said, I will pick the stock that I love. I love the yeah. stock. You're supposed to do a nice research before investing, not just love the company yeah. or the stock. <laughs> But you know, there are so many people who are like, I love this yeah, stock I love just Apple. because I love it. And the, uh, yeah, like, it's like, oh, yeah, like, cool, you have an iPhone. Doesn't necessarily mean you should be investing in the company. Right. Um, and that's not to say that, like, personal use or interest is not a valid reason to invest. But there's just a lot more to it. And I think people who are 
regular people who don't look through financial statements don't recognize that. And that's why it's a lot easier to kind of just um, essentially buy baskets of Halloween candy instead of putting all of your investment into just one candy bar. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. A relationship, marriage, and finances. So yeah. surprisingly, we see that many couples are shy away talking about their personal finances and debt. So from your perspective, at what point in a relationship should couples start having serious conversation about finances? What's the right time? I think as soon as they start dating. Or like, frankly, first the date. first date. First date. First date. <laughs> and listen. How much first... debt do you have? <laughs> no. Okay, listen. You're not like, show me your pay stub. Right. Um, but on your first date, I really do think you should be talking about money. Uh, and it doesn't have to be so aggressive. It can just be like, if money wasn't a factor, what would your dream vacation be? Because someone who says I would ball out on a villa and bring all of my friends, we're going to go to Thailand is a very different person than someone who's like, I don't know. I might just take a long weekend and drive up to XYZ. I think that those two people are great for two very different partners, but you need to know what type of person you are. And once you have the easy stuff like that, you know, I think the first date, you also have to talk about who's paying for the date. Are you splitting it? Who's paying? Um, then when you start to date more seriously, you can talk a little bit more about uh, how you want to split costs going forward. When you start thinking about seriously dating that person, calling them your significant other, it's, Hey, like, are we supposed to move in together? Do you want to do that? Like, should we, should we talk about how we're going to split expenses when we are starting to share things like utilities and somebody has got to pay for toilet paper? Like which one of us is it going to be? Are we splitting it? Like what's going on? And then as long as you're starting to talk about finance early and often in your relationship, it'll become less and less awkward. So by the time you get to the really important stuff of, Hey, like we're getting engaged, like, how are we going to create a joint account or what's getting paid from the joint account? Do we keep separate accounts still? How are we paying for the wedding? Should we buy a home? How much are kids going to cost? How many do you want? Do we want to take care of our in-laws in old age? Like all of these questions are a little bit scarier, but if you've been having the money talk since date number one, it's going to feel a lot less intimidating. And my fiance and I, we've been together for now almost seven years. We've certainly had our fair share of fights, but we have never once fought about money. Mm. What do you think about if man is working and woman is sitting with kids at home? You know, I think even just the way that you said that is really downplaying the amount of unpaid labor that stay at home parents have to do. Uh, they're not just sitting at home. They are, you know, the chef, they are the chauffeur, they are the, um, the cleaner, they are everything. And, Oftentimes when there is a stay at home parent, I think there should be a conversation about the finances of like, Hey, I am giving up a well-paying career to do this. Like we need to make sure that we are financially equitable and that I feel like I still have access to my own money. Even if you're not earning it for the home, the only reason your partner is able to go out and bring home the bacon is because you take care of everything at home. So I would just say, I think everybody should be getting a prenuptial agreement, get a prenup and discuss what it's going to look like if things don't work out. The same way that people buy car insurance or health insurance, you don't expect to get a kidney stone. You don't expect to total your car, but these things do happen. And no one who's ever gotten a prenup has ever said, oh, I regret getting a prenup. But plenty of people who didn't get them do say, I regret not getting one. So highly recommend getting a prenup in your relationship. It is far easier to run a company. It is significantly easier to run a company uh, than raise a child, uh, you know, to give to give 100 percent to that child, which I, I think a lot of stay at home moms do. Or I won't discount the stay at home dads, but I just wanted to chime in there because I don't think 
anybody who disagrees should be the primary stay at home parent for at least five days and see how you feel. And I, I think that your mind will change very quickly about just how much value they add, because trust me, they're, they're worth, I would, I, I'd probably say double or triple your salary of what you're making right now in terms of what they provide. It's 24 seven around the job. So if I have a debt, for example, before I entering the relationship and I have my, my debt, should I discuss it from the very beginning or? Yeah, I think you should be really honest about your financial situation because um, sex and money are the top two reasons why couples fight. And mm -hmm. frankly, if I was dating someone and you know we had gotten pretty serious and they didn't come forward with that information, I would feel like they were hiding it from me. And there's not anything that I want my partner to hide from me unless they're trying to plan me a surprise birthday party. So uh, I, I think... But wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be so weird to discuss, okay, hi, I'm on first date. I have a debt, by the way. No, not you don't have to bring it up on your first date. First but, 30 days. No, but I do think first like if you're, seriously, <laughs> if you're seriously considering a life with someone, you can share like, hey, just so you know, like I want to make sure that like we start our life together on solid financial footing. I want to be really honest in that I have XYZ amount of debt from whatever you might have it from. And I want you to know that so you're able to make a you know educated decision about how you feel about us putting our finances together. Because if you don't share that information and you hide it, if you have hidden credit card debt or a hidden student loan or hidden anything, it's financial infidelity. Yeah. I don't care. You're lying to me. And I don't want to be lied to in any situation unless it's you know for a happy surprise. So I just think that you should be honest. You don't need to be so honest on your first date just because that can certainly scare people away. But in the same way that you're not like, oh, by the way, like I have like a toenail that's ingrown on your first right. date. You're not sharing that. But ultimately, if someone loves you or someone really cares about you, I highly doubt that like your one weird toenail is going to be the big turnoff in the same way that if you've already decided to build a life with someone, you want to make sure that your partner understands the full picture of your financial situation, because maybe if you have half a million dollars in debt, they don't want to hitch their wagon to your horse and that you should be okay with that. This week or this month slash last month, we've seen uh, a resurgence of cryptocurrency, a lot of people pumping in their money mm -hmm. and institutions as well. So with Bitcoin hitting an all time high this week, Ethereum having a major surge right now. What are your thoughts on cryptocurrency as an investment option? Do you believe it has a place in someone's investment portfolio? And under what circumstances might it be considered a wise addition to that portfolio? Yeah, for sure. Um, so full disclosure, I own Bitcoin and Ethereum. But the one thing that I always say is that cryptocurrency is not a bad investment, but it certainly shouldn't be a like a husky portion of your investment portfolio. Because I don't want to see people investing in cryptocurrency until they've already maxed out all of their tax advantaged retirement accounts. They already feel really confident with their emergency fund. They've paid down any high interest rate debt. Like there are 18 steps you should be doing before you get to cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is a nice to have. It is a bonus. And frankly, any dollar that you put into crypto, you should be ready to lose because it is an incredibly volatile asset class. It is frankly, not nearly regulated enough even now. And you just don't know. The yeah. amount of money I have in cryptocurrency is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of my entire investment portfolio. I have investments in public equities, in bonds, in um, certain private investments, You know, whether that be private equity, like startups, anything. I own a home. I max out all of my tax advantaged accounts every single year. I do all of that before I even like start to smell the thought of cryptocurrency. And I would say never, ever have crypto be more than one to 5% of your entire investment portfolio. And, and, I know, and I know that your goal is to have 25 mil invested under 4%. Mm -hmm. This is very conservative, 4%. Where, yeah, is, it, where, where, where is this coming from? Yeah, so 4% is essentially um, a very conservative investment return. If I get eight, if I get 10, which is, you know, the S&P 500 has returned eight to 10% every single year since its inception, like that's more likely, but anything additional is gravy. I wanna make sure a super, super conservative return is still able to fund my lifestyle. 
And once I have that, I know I'm going to be able to really downshift in my career or at least downshift in opportunities that I, that I take because I need to pay rent or pay for my expenses. I don't necessarily need to work for money anymore at that point. I can take on a lot more pro bono work. I can do a lot more charity and philanthropic work because I don't need the money. I just want to do it. How, how, right. long, how long is your goal? When, when are you expecting to hit your goal? I mean, as soon as possible. Uh, I'd love to do, be able to do it in the next 10 years, uh, but that's to be seen. So we'll see how much okay. money I make. We'll, we'll follow up on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's been the most influential person in your financial education journey? And what was one of the most valuable lessons they've taught you? Yeah, so it is definitely my first manager at my first job, my mentor. She's still my mentor now. I see her regularly. She's the best. Um, one of the most important pieces of advice she ever taught me was to be a high value person and also recognize that value. So don't let other people, other co like companies cheapen you. So when someone in your life is not treating you with respect or they only, you know, they're taking you for granted, don't put up with that. She mm -hmm. always told me that you don't need that person as much as they need you feel free to cut them out of your life in the same way that if you are in a workplace where you are not being treated with respect, you are not given the opportunities you deserve, given how hard you work and how well you're doing, it's time to go. And she was always the first person to remind me that I had value. I was worthy. I deserved all of the things that I wanted. And all I had to do was ask for them. It's so beautiful. Thanks so much for sharing that. You know, I love when people get nice mentors on their life. I mean, this is very important yeah. besides parents, because we can we can uh, affect our kids all the way possible, all all we want. But if they're going to, you know, meet the right mentor at the job or I don't know, at the university or college anywhere. I mean, this is very huge. If this was the last time you could share your message with the world, what would you, what mm. would you want? your final piece of advice be? Ooh, okay. So it's actually a quote. Um, so Francis Picabia said, our heads are round, so our thoughts can change direction. Um, I feel like when I was kind of like coming up, maybe end of college, start of my career, I very much had the mindset that people should just work harder because I was working so hard and it would just be easier. But I've come to realize that that isn't true. We aren't all given the same opportunities. We're not all given a fair shake. And life, frankly, is very hard for many, many people. And we need to give them grace and we should give ourselves grace when things don't work out the way we want them to. Ultimately, like kind of the takeaway here is that like, when you are presented with new information, you are allowed to get smarter. You don't have to like die on every hill of every opinion you've ever had. When you learn more as we get smarter and more experienced and wiser and older, frankly, you are allowed to change your opinion. And I think that's really, really powerful because it just reminds me that all of us can afford to be a little bit better every single day.